I'm your host, Eric Heath, and I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 86 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 086. Well, let's just say that uh, things are sounding different. I moved equipment around. I bumped some settings. And apparently, I missed some settings on the mixer. And while I run the next audio clip, I'll adjust it. And you'll get to hear me actually tuning the audio. Now, with that said, let's move on to the gun of the show. The gun of the show for this episode is the Colt Delta Elite. Now, I really didn't know this gun was back into production. However, recently I had the opportunity to buy a brand new uh, gun of the new production run, and I couldn't pass it up. I always wanted a 10 millimeter uh, and a 1911 platform, and unfortunately, they have never been had one available in any of the gun stores when I had the money. But that recently changed. I picked up this Delta Elite, and well, I've been happy with it. Now, the Delta Elite was Colt's first entry into the 10 millimeter market, and it in all honesty, it was the second production 10 millimeter after the Bren 10. The Bren 10 was the first, the Delta Elite was the second. Now the Glock 20, the Glock 29, and even the Glock 40, which I did see a Glock 40 recently. I saw that at, uh, let's see here, I want to say it was the Ellis Gun Shack in Lubbock, Texas. Actually, they're south of Lubbock, but they're Lubbock, Texas. Let's just be honest. But moving back to the Delta Elite, I have to say that the Glock series of pistols probably are, for the money, the best 10 millimeter pistols on the market. However, for me, the 1911 platform is the better platform because that's what I shoot regularly, that's what I'm familiar with, everything's in the right place, and if something goes wrong, I am far more capable of fixing a 1911-based firearm than I am a Glock or an XD or anything else. Now, the model number that you can get this gun you can get this gun now with the model number zero, or not zero, it's O as in uh, Octavius, 2020. So basically, we're looking at October 2020 as the model number. Caliber, as I have said already, it's chambered in 10 millimeter. It's got an 8 plus 1 capacity, like just about all real 1911s. Well, actually, like all real 1911s, not some bizarro clones that may have extra width and extra capacity as a result. It is a single action only firearm. Now the sights, the rear sight is drift is a drift adjustable sight. It's very similar to the GI style sight. It's not quite the GI style, but it's very similar. The front is a fixed sight and they are three dot sights. This one's in stainless steel, although you can get the blued finish. It weighs in at 35 ounces and it has an MSRP of $1,099. I have shot this gun. I've got probably 60 rounds or so through it, and I've just set up my press so I can reload 10 millimeter. You know what? That's. I think we're going to do some episodes on reloading because I do get a lot of questions about that under normal conditions. So I think we're going to go back and we're going to touch on reloading on a much more intense scale. I'll have to come up with some details for that, but we will. Anyways, let me tell you how to get the show. And before we do that, let me say that after we come back from this, I'll tell you where we're at with the 1,000-round uh, test on the uh, STI Lawman 5.0. But we're going to make that, it's just going to be a very brief touch on that because that's going to be what our next episode's about. But this episode is, like I already said in the previous episode, this episode is about uh, basically reciprocal licenses you know, that we recognize here in Texas as well as non-resident license that we recognize here in Texas. Anyways, here's how you get the show. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Okay, we got that done. As I said, we're going to touch on the, we're going to touch on where we're at with the STI Lawman 5.0 thousand round test. The test has been completed. I'll give you a review and the results of that test in the next episode. I am going to say right now that I have had 
some interest from people saying, hey, yeah, we're interested in this. Can you give me more information? Uh, and I had a lot of people ask me for a blow-by-blow -blow result. Well, we're not doing that. Anyhow, let me just say I'm going to do a review on that firearm, and I will get back to you. I'm just super busy with work, and we're going to get that in the next episode, so look for it in two weeks. Okay? With that said, let's move on to listener feedback. I am going to, okay, I have an email here. I was just going to start reading it, but that doesn't quite work. He asked that we, okay, let me read this a little more carefully. Okay, this is the one I think it is. Now, he asked in the email before I copied and pasted this into the show notes, he asked that we do not, under any circumstances, mention his name. He's afraid it might, if somebody hears it, they might, uh, it might make his life more difficult with either his clientele or with uh, his co-workers, I guess you could call it. Now, with that said, name withheld, wrote, into, wrote in with the following. I am an attorney in a small Texas town where I recently had a discussion with the city attorney regarding the city manager's desire to post a 30-06 or a 30-07 sign, or to post 30-06 and 30-07 signs. I took the position that either sign is a violation of Texas Government Code 411.209, and I'm quoting this email. So when I say I and my, this is what he wrote, not what, I, what I'm saying. My position is based on Ken Paxton's opinion numbers KP0047 and KP0049, as well as the, the specific language of, tech, of Penal Code 307, which refers to license holders and persons licensed under the License to Carry Law. Government Code 411.209 specifically states, and he's got this in single quotes, or by any sign expressly referring to that law or to a concealed handgun license, end a single quote. Now, that section he's got there, so when it says that law, it's actually referring to Texas Penal Code Section 30.6, which has since, he goes on to point out that the, well, let me continue, go back and read this. Government Code 411.209 specifically states, single quote, or by any sign expressly referring to that law or to a concealed handgun license, single quote, which has since been renamed to a license to carry. The name of the license has changed, however. The intent of the legislature was to prevent signs that specifically refer to that license. I know you have been involved with parties that lobbied for all of this legislation and are privy to discussions on this topic, and I was wondering if you have any input or knowledge on this topic. Normally, I would ask one of my paralegals to look into this. However, they are both out due to the birth of their new daughter. And personally, I want to say congratulations for that. If he listens, he would, if he doesn't mind forwarding this. The moral of that story is that hiring a married couple as your paralegals normally works out great. But it can really hit you with a double whammy from time to time. Yeah, that makes sense. I found you and started listening when you had Mr. Cotton on and I was looking for a CHL instructor for my grandson who lives in Katy. I urged him to take Mr. Cotton's class, but I don't know who he eventually took it from with all the chaos of his wedding going on at the time. Okay. I love your podcast and when you have come forward and said you recommend people... Or okay, let me go back. I, lo I skipped a line here. I love the podcast... I like how you try to be careful with your language. In all truth, what really sold me on your podcast was when you have come forward and said that you recommend people follow Mr. Cotton's advice if you and him ever make a conflicting statement. Well, that's because I really do recommend people listen to Cotton over myself. I do not remember what it was you were talking about, but that stood out to me as the mark of someone who will admit they are wrong, when they are wrong and is willing to do the right thing. Thanks for the great podcast. I look forward to hearing back from you on any input that you have. Well, I said, and my response was, I am not privy to any internal discussions or anything like that. And I haven't had any discussions with anybody on this. I mentioned his email in a thread on the Texas CHL forum. Charles, he, he responded to it. And Charles thinks that it may be tenuous because the name of the license changed, but I also suggested that this listener, and we shall call him Name Withheld, but I suggested that Name Withheld actually go ahead and contact Mr. Cotton himself, as he put it, and I'll, I'll straight up say that 
he's got good points in the email, but I am nervous about actually trying to trying to force a 30-07 to be taken down using this logic simply because the very specific language uh, in 2.11 or 4.11.209 where it says, or to a concealed handgun license. I think we need to go in and clean up the license or the language in 4.11.209 where it basically refers to a license or a, or to a license or individual licensed under yada yada. We just need to clear that language up so that it can be applied to 30.06 and 30.07. I think we could, I know we're going to see an attempt to revise this law, both from our side and the other side, but I don't know what, I don't know what we're going to see. I really don't. Let me, let me throw this out there as something that we're going to see changes on. You know, I suggested that name with hell contact Charles Cotton. And I strongly recommend that I also suggested he listen to Charles Cotton's podcast, which is at the Texas Firearms Coalition website. Now, I've pushed that podcast in the last episode. I've thrown up several emails out there, but we're good now. We got that out of the way. We got the email out of the way. I don't want to go into too much more email because I spent a lot more time than I wanted to on it. And I'm going to run the audio clip that tells you how to find me on social media. And then, and only then, are we going to come back and talk about out-of-state licenses, non-resident licenses, should you, shouldn't you, and all that. With that said, here's how you find us on social media. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Well, the topic of this episode is going to be, should you have an out-of-state license? Now, there are advantages to a Texas license. Number one, Texas does not release license status information to the public. That means if the, if the Houston Chronicle decides they want to publish a list of all people licensed to carry a handgun in Texas, they can't. Used to, they could send an email saying, hey, does so-and-so have a concealed handgun license? And the state of Texas would answer back yes or no, and they'd send that person, an e- uh, a, if they had one, they'd send them a letter saying, you have been, it has been asked if you have a concealed handgun license, yada, yada, and so-and-so asked, but the law was changed, and that information is now treated as confidential. Now, another advantage to a Texas license in Texas is the exemption from gun-free school zones. Now, this is a federal law, and the federal law says that if you have a license from the state the school is in, then the Gun-Free School Zones Act does not apply. Now, another advantage of a Texas concealed handgun license is that you get training on Texas laws. So if you're going to carry here in the state of Texas, you're going to get training on what the law says in Texas. Now, also in Texas, you get an exemption to the NICS background check when you buy a new firearm or a used firearm at a dealer. You walk in, you put your license down with your driver's license, you put your money down, you fill out the 4473, the dealer takes all that, records information off your licenses, gives you your license back, keeps his money, gives you your gun. It's as simple as that. Additionally, if you're going to carry on a Texas license, you don't have to worry about states that do not recognize a non-resident license as far as reciprocity goes. There are states that do not recognize non-resident license from another state. There's even an effort to push this in Texas one time. You also increase the numbers and improve the statistics that the DPS releases regarding license holders if you have the Texas CHL or license to carry habit there. Now, Texas renewals are actually cheaper than some states are. What does this mean? It means that Texas is expensive, but there are some states that do not give a discounted renewal price. Texas does. Now, Texas renewal no longer requires a class either. Some other states, they do. Now, I'm going to say that there are reasons to consider getting an out-of-state non-resident license in addition to, not in place of, but in addition to a Texas license. With a non-resident license from another state, you do gain some reciprocity with states that do not recognize a Texas license. You also get some coverage to continue carrying 
if your Texas license is lost or stolen, or if you have to use your weapon and your license and weapon are confiscated as evidence, you still have that non-resident license from another state to continue carrying with. Now, the reason I brought this topic up, I had an email. Well, actually, I had several emails, but one of the emails that really caused me to do this, they were wanting to know if I could recommend some non-resident license from other states. And I want to give you four. The Arizona license, the Florida license, the one that everybody seems to want being the Utah license, Florida's a good close second, and the Virginia license. All four of these are really good, recommended, out-of-state, non-resident licenses. Another email I had asked the question, should Texas residents get a Texas license? And I actually had several emails asking that question just worded differently. And the answer is yes, if at all possible. The advantages are numerous. It helps build up the statistics. As I said, there's the added benefit that Texas law enforcement officers do not have to determine if that license is covered under reciprocity. Let's say you get pulled over by a small town police officer. He's he's new to the force. He knows that there's reciprocity reciprocity with other states, but he doesn't know exactly which ones. Okay. Now this officer pulls you over. You got a Texas driver's license, and you hand him a out of state license. Now he has to determine if you are carrying legally with this out of state license. He has to determine if that out-of-state license is recognized by Texas. And he may not have been trained to understand that, hey, a Texas resident does not have to have a Texas license to carry. If you have a Texas license, you avoid all those problems. Additionally, it helps you protect reciprocity from efforts to limit or eliminate a non-resident license being covered. Another email was, well, why should we protect non-resident license reciprocity? And people have heard me talk about this before. And I keep saying we need to defend it. I've said this on other podcasts that I've done. I've said it when I was a guest on a different podcast. In fact, I don't even know if they ever released that episode. I need to go back and check that. I kind of hurt their feelings. It wasn't a gun-related podcast, but they wanted to know about guns. And then I kind of destroyed their worldview. That's the problem with facts and not emotions. Facts tend to do that. But why should we protect a non-resident license rest? Uh, the reciprocity for a non-resident license. Well, first off, you may have a time when there's a massive rush on get people getting a concealed handgun license in Texas, and you may see a massive delay for those trying to get a license here in Texas. If somebody needs to carry immediately, or the sooner the better, if they are being stalked or uh, threatened or something like that, they can go They can get an out-of-state license. They can carry on it while they wait for a Texas license. And you know what? It works out. Another advantage to protecting reciprocity for non-resident licenses, and Jesus Christ, that's hard to say, is that when somebody loses a license or it's stolen, say a a pickpocket gets their license, or maybe they leave their wallet somewhere and the wallet gets stolen, they can carry on a non-resident license while they wait on a replacement to be sent. Or, conceivably, if they have to defend themselves and their license is taken as evidence, they can carry on the non-resident license until they get it back. Overall, non-resident licenses are critical. I have to say it. They are critical. We have to protect them. You have people saying, well, if they're in Texas, they need a Texas license just like they got to have a Texas driver's license. Well, sometimes when somebody moves to the state, they can still drive on their driver's license they have from another state until they establish residency and they get their license from another, or they get their license uh, transferred to Texas. However, for concealed handgun purposes, establishing residency takes time, and someone that's carrying on a non-reciprocal, non-resi- or on a reciprocal non-resident license can benefit greatly from having a Texas license, but they can't get it. So maybe they do carry on that non-resident reciprocal license until they get their Texas license. They don't lose their rights just because they moved to Texas, and that's critical. In fact, with Texas offering a non-resident license, if they plan it out, they can get a Texas license before they move here. And while they are doing so, maybe, and just maybe, they can take and help convince our legislature 
that there's no point in this residency requirement. Issue the state of Texas license. If somebody's a non-resident, then, hey, you know, listed as a non-resident. But if they're a Texas resident, then it can be listed as such. If they're new to Texas, if they can show that they have utilities in their name, go ahead and cut them a resident license. That's all that it takes to make sense. I had a lot more on this, but looking looking at all the news I've got and the memo from our news girl, I think I'm going to cut it off there. I've covered all the key points. So with that said, let me run the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with me. After this, I'll come back and we'll hit all the news and I'll tell you what her memo says. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Okay. Our news girl sent us a memo with the news that said, do not cut any of this. This is your last and only warning. Do not cut any of it. And I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. I'm counting 12 news articles here. We're going to entertain her. We're going to cover all the news that she has in here. She says she's cut the ones that I normally would cut, but I think I would have cut it down further. I would have limited it to like half of what she's given us. In fact, that's weird. It's weird that she's given us twice as much as what I would normally do. Hmm. Okay, moving on to the very first category in defense of self and others. Officers in El Paso, Texas, discharged their weapons, resulting in the death of a man who had made threats against them prior to making an overt get gesture. Now, the gesture resulted in making the officers fear for their safety and discharged their weapons. Most likely, this gesture was reaching behind his back or reaching where he may have had a weapon concealed. As with all officer-involved shootings in Texas, this one will be investigated by the Texas Rangers. Now, we have another story where a University of North Texas student who was fatally shot by police for approaching them with an axe had a blood alcohol content of .21. Holy cow, that, that can't be right. It has to be .021. I mean, .21 is over a fifth of his blood was alcohol. There's no way somebody could live with that level of alcohol in their system. Okay, looking at the story, it says 0.21%. So 0.05% is intoxicated. 0.21% is is still uh, pretty high up there. You're risking alcohol poisoning. Now, he also had marijuana in his system, and and an attorney for the student's family said no tasers, no chemicals, and no tolerance were used in this student's killing. Apparently, this attorney has no understanding of the concept of self-defense. Now, an employee with a, with the uh, well with a South Dallas Metro PCS store shot and killed a would-be armed robber who had ordered everyone to the floor. Now, apparently, this employee was in the back room, heard a commotion from where he was at. He retrieved a firearm and then proceeded to stop the criminal. The suspect was transported to the hospital where he died from his wounds. No victims or employees were reported as injured in the article. Moving on to criminal activity, and this is one of my favorite categories. An armed suspect was taken to the hospital after being shot by a Houston officer. Hmm, I do have to edit that. I didn't catch that before. Hmm, okay, let me just reread this. Okay, I finished retyping it where it's a little bit better. I may go back and edit it again. An armed suspect was taken to the hospital after being shot by a Houston officer. The suspect that was running at him when the officer... Oh, man, I messed it up too. Now, the suspect was running at him when the officer felt he had to shoot. Now, the suspect had been observed shoving a beaten beaten woman in the street prior to running at the officer. That's Okay, that's just difficult to follow, so I'm just going to delete the whole thing or that whole sentence. Now, the female victim was also hospitalized along with the armed suspect. Normally, I love the criminal activity section because she puts articles in here where criminals get their comeuppance. Police are searching for three men who tried to rub... uh, Good Lord. 
I don't proofread it because she's got a note threatening retaliation and she's full of spell check errors. Police are searching for three men who tried to rob a gun store in Garland, Texas. The men did successfully rob another man who was delivering water at a nearby business. Okay. So apparently they tried to rob the gun store, failed, and then went and robbed a guy delivering water. These are not your brightest criminals. Moving on to politics, the Texas Attorney General, Ken Paxton, will permit McClellan County to continue their ban on firearms in their courthouse with their plan to move a number of offices out of the courthouse and into another building. While not an ideal solution, this agreement does meet the letter of the law. In the same vein, Texas counties are planning to push back against a new law, that would be 411.209, I believe, that provides penalties for illegal gun bans by political agencies and political subdivisions of the state. The refusal of these counties to obey the law shows the need to remove off-limits locations for license holders and improve the fines for signs law. Wow. When she emailed me about that, I actually put that as my response to the article that she emailed to me. And she included it in the description of the story. I'm trying to read your... We'll call, we'll call her... We'll call her Shelly for this episode. I'm trying to read Shelly's uh, stories as she put them in here. Verbatim. Although I'm having a difficult time doing that, I always do because I like to expand or comment. And I'm certain I'm really going to fail at some point in here. But she is making an effort to include my comments from where we discussed it. So we might we might be able to read most of these verbatim. Maybe. As long as she spell checks the re- as long as she has spell checked the rest of them and grammar checked and made sure that she doesn't have partial sentences connected to partial sentences connected to partial sentences. But moving on in the political category, we have an article where we hear about the evils and dangers of fake firearms. Now, essentially, and I'm going to, this is me. This is not her. I'm going to edit it where my comments are essentially what's in the show notes for this news item. In my opinion, this is more of an issue in regards to education. This country has had fake firearms as long as it's had real firearms, and they have looked real. So why is this suddenly a problem for Uh, law enforcement. Well, maybe it's because they're having a hard time banning real guns, so they want to just go ahead and ban fake ones. Now, I do have an article where the Texas Medical Association wants to make it illegal to carry firearms in a hospital, which it already is because of Texas Penal Code Section 46.035, subsections B4, and that's subsection B, and sub-subsection 4, provided the license holder was given notice per Texas Penal Code Sections 30.6 and 30.7. Now, the requirement for notice under 30.6 and 30.7 can be found in 46.035 subsection I. People usually read to where they want to see, and they don't read all the way down to I. But in this case, we're going to get subsection I as well. In the Crimes on Campus article or section of the news, because I know that's the next one, we have a story about the recent murder of a student on the University of Texas campus that has spiked interest in self-defense classes for students across the nation. I read that one almost verbatim. Almost. Now, in September, campus carry goes into effect for many colleges across the state, which will allow some students to better protect themselves if attacked. And I added that last long line there. I'll be honest. We got to get campus carry expanded in the next legislative session. We have to have uniformity as to what can and cannot be placed off limits. Should a professor's office be able to be placed off limits by the professor? No. Can that professor's office be placed off limits by the dean? Maybe, maybe not. I don't think they should be able to. I think it's just like a classroom that if you have a ban in classrooms, then you're effectively banning guns on the campus for students in that class. As a result, you really shouldn't allow a ban on concealed weapons in the professor's office either or the TA's office. I think that, uh, I think the legislature needs to go back. They need to limit what can be placed off limits. And the good news is they're going to have the data to show what the different colleges think needs to be placed off limits. Once they have that data, they can edit it as they see fit and build their own system. And that, should make people happier or less unhappy. Let's move on to the miscellaneous story. Austin, Texas officer, or miscellaneous stories, 
Austin, Texas officers who admitted a dog did not pose a threat before they shot it. Okay. All right, now it makes sense. Austin, Texas officers who admitted a dog did not pose a threat before they shot it now face a lawsuit after a federal judge's rule to allow the proceedings to continue. The judge, however, did dismiss claims that Austin PD was negligent for failing to develop proper policies regarding the use of force against dogs. Often, I'm a dog lover, I like police officers, and I understand the threat that dogs pose, but I've also seen police officers that they're of the opinion if you've got a gun and a dog is acting even remotely like they might eventually somehow in the distant future become aggressive towards them, that they should be shot. Me and a officer that was in one of the towns that I work or live in had a disagreement about it because... I had to deal with a dog on a regular basis that was uh, more than a little aggressive. At one point, I nearly destroyed the dog. I didn't. And several times, he told me I should have put it down. The truth of the matter is, I didn't want to destroy someone's pet unnecessarily. I have never had to discharge my weapon in defense. I didn't want to ruin that record, especially for a dog I could handle in another way. And in all honesty, law enforcement needs to... To be trained on how to deal with dogs other than destroying them. Moving on, and I believe this is our last news article, in Lubbock, two teens were examining a pistol when the younger of the two discharged the firearm, wounding the older in the neck. I'm attaching a rant to this one. In our modern society, the majority of children, teens, and even young adults live in a world where some of their firearms knowledge, and in fact, in some cases, all or the majority of it, comes from the internet, movies, and television. However, the majority of it comes from video games, and that actually makes things worse. I'm not blaming video games for gun violence. Don't get me wrong. I'm blaming bad parenting. Parents will turn their children loose with a video game, or the TV, or the internet, and they let that be the babysitter. They let that teach the child what they should be teaching the child. As a result, they go out into the world thinking, when they do something wrong, they can always go back to a save point and recover it. Well, maybe not quite that bad, but it's getting that way. They don't understand that actions have consequences because in the reality that they've spent the majority of their life, actions really don't have consequences. As a result, things in those games like weapons don't have consequences associated with them. Now, this is going to be controversial when I say it, but schools should do a firearms safety education course and it should be an honest-to-God firearms safety education. It should not be no liberalized guns are bad. It should be, in kindergarten, students should be uh, started out with the Eddie Eagle, stop, don't touch, run away, tell a grown-up. And it should get progressively more advanced as the students get older. Teenagers should be uh, drilled with the four rules of gun safety. They should be told, do not touch this Do not touch a firearm unless you have permission from your parents. And when they get old, when they are seniors, if they actually own firearms, maybe they can be told, well, you know the safety and you know the consequences because that'll be part of it. Follow it. Follow the gun safety. I mean, we have people being taught how to put condoms on cucumbers. And this is done so that they can prevent the spread of diseases or unwanted pregnancies. Maybe, maybe we need to adopt that and teach children how to have real gun safety so that they don't have an accidental shooting and accidentally shoot their friend because they're curious about a firearm. Their parents aren't doing the job and society is suffering for it. Maybe their parents should be prosecuted for leaving the firearms where the students can get to them because that's the law in Texas. That's enough of a rant. I'm going to run the audio clip that will uh, let us wrap the show up and with on that note, I would like to thank you, the listener. I'd like to thank anyone who has uh, emailed in. I may not have got to it this episode. I may have covered it in an earlier episode, but I do respond when you email me unless the spam filter eats it. Speaking of which, the spam filter on this computer has been eating a lot of email, and this is the one that handles my Gmail account. With that said, please stay safe, carry responsibly, and until next time, Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please 
carry responsibly.